Thomas King, Chief Executive Officer of Food Frontier. Thanks for joining us in the Evoke Ag Studio. Thank you so much for having me. What would you like delegates who have heard you speak here at this event take home? What, what, what would be the take home message from the things you've said? I mean, my intention of being here is to help industry leaders understand the immense economic opportunity that Alternative Proteins presents. So my organisation, Food Frontier, is Australia's independent think tank and industry accelerator for plant-based and cell-based meat. And I've spent the last three years with the leaders in this space in places like America and Israel and Europe, and it's moving at a very considerable pace. And uh, leading authorities on food security and food systems are confident it's going to be a big part of future of food. And so my intention is to uh, help industry leaders here, government and new innovators understand the opportunities that exist for Australia to leverage our strengths and unique value propositions to become another leader in alternative proteins alongside those other markets. What sort of reception are you having? Very positive, yeah. I mean, I, I came from presenting a couple of days ago in Wodonga to 150 primary producers, cattle farmers and sheep farmers, and uh, very positive response, Very a lot of curiosity, a lot of interest, uh, you know, a spectrum of uh, different opinions. Yes. There were a couple of sort of old, old, older gentlemen who um, asked some slightly provocative questions, but then down the other end there were people there who just sat back and listened and went, this makes sense. You know, the, the, the concept of being able to produce protein and meat products without having to breed, feed, raise, slaughter entire animals uh, makes a lot of sense from a resource efficiency and economic standpoint. And ultimately, you know, farmers are business people. Um, and so explaining that with fewer inputs, you, inputs, you can have greater outputs, uh, a lot of them uh, saw it as a, a, a very worth, worthwhile endeavour. How do you explain it to you know your average consumer? People yeah. are more and more interested in in the food that they eat and yeah. um, the, and want to make a connection with where it comes from. But this is kind of this is a big step, isn't it? This is something that uh, at the moment is largely an unknown. How do you make it more known? Yeah, so I mean, there are two main approaches that we look at: either replicating meat products using plant ingredients, or growing actual meat, but by feeding cells nutrients. And so if we start with the idea of, of plant proteins or plant-based meat alternatives, it's essentially companies who uh, have evolved past the days of terrible tasting soy sausages of the 1980s to actually utilize new technologies and new science to, or existing science to understand what makes meat meat, what makes it look, smell, taste, sizzle like meat. And the answer is a certain combination of proteins and fats and trace minerals and water, all the same things found in plants. And so they then look to the plant kingdom to understand what different plant species, including potentially ones that haven't been widely explored for food before, can we borrow those different ingredients and elements from and combine them in such a fashion to offer that juicy burger or sizzling sausage, but from plants and therefore with a fraction of the environmental impacts, uh, health safety benefits, um, and still in that familiar form with the sensory experience people are used to. In the field of cellular agriculture, it's producing actual meat, but instead of feeding a whole bunch of nutrients to a cow or a chicken or a pig and then wasting the majority of those calories in energy expenditure and the development of a skeletal system and the sorts of things we don't really want in the final end product. Uh, you're taking a tiny sample of cells, say a sesame seed size you know, biopsy from a cow, and feeding those cells nutri nutrients directly and essentially a, a nutrient bath. Okay, um, so how long would it take to grow a steak? Uh, for instance, I mean, I'm just trying to visualise it, really. Well, well, once it's scaled, so at the moment they're sort of testing, right, in, in, in laboratory sort of environments. But once it's scaled, it'll look far more like a beer brewery, to be honest. Tall steel tanks, cultivators um, with right. meat growing. And so the idea is in 15 or 20 years, you can go down to your local meat brewery and uh, see how your meat is made. And it can be made to be anatomically identical. It can be made to have a superior nutritional profile, different you know, flavor profiles and texture depending on what people want. So there's opportunity for, I guess, tailor-made meats uh, depending on consumers, dietary and uh, taste preferences. Potentially then it's not only a farming 
uh, revolution. It's a, a health revolution if you can increase the nutrient value of things that are produced in this way. Potentially, yeah. So there's a few benefits from a public health standpoint. One is the absence of bacterial contamination that is a, a problem in our current meat production system. So you don't have slaughter, you don't have an intestinal tract involved and therefore you don't have the E. coli and uh, Salmonella, Campylobacter, etc., that can contaminate meat today. So you don't have that food foodborne illness risk. Antibiotics and hormones aren't necessary, so a, a big issue worldwide um, is the heavy use of antibiotics in farming, which is leading to antibiotic resistant superbugs, as they're being labelled, um, which is a hugely concerning issue. I want to be able to use antibiotics in 30 years when I get a tooth infection and for them to be able to work and not, you know. <laughs> I don't want to die. Uh, and so we need to reevaluate our use of antibiotics in, this, in these systems and cell culturing meat doesn't require that. Are you dealing with a bit of a, how can I put it, yuck factor with um, producing food in this way? There have been a variety of consumer perception studies done in different markets around the world, and it, and it varies, and it depends on how the study is set up and how much information is provided to consumers. So the lowest that I've seen is 20% of uh, respondents saying that they'd be willing to try it, all the way up to a study in Belgium that found only 9% of people weren't willing to try it. And typically the theme is the more information people are given about what it is, how it's made, how it's different and similar to the meat that they know and love and eat today, um, the more likely they are to try it. So I think that that transparency and that education is really important in uh, that commercial phase that we'll start to see happening over coming years with products hitting the market. And how do you think it will unfold over coming years and what sort of time scales do you believe um, are involved? Depends who you ask, <laughs> and you're asking me. <laughs> uh, you, you'd be very optimistic, I'm sure. Well, I, I, I'm an optimistic realist, and from the companies that we're connected with and the experts that I have spoken with, um, I think in the next couple of years we'll see products starting to become available in particular regions of the world in very limited capacity. So we're talking about you know, there might be a restaurant in New York that decides to serve it as sort of a novel food option and from there it will expand. I think it could be close to a decade until uh, these kinds of foods are produced on a considerable scale that allows you know, a large number of consumers to access them. In terms of plant-based meat alternatives, they're already on the market and the growth is in incredibly uh, rapid. So the leading companies in this space from places like America, they simply can't keep up, keep up with the demand at the moment uh, and are starting to expand globally. Uh, we're supporting a number of startups here in Australia who are both on the plant-based and cell-based side. So part of our objective is how do we get Australian industry and innovators engaged in this space and capitalising on it now uh, in addition to traditional forms of food production so that we have a more secure uh, competitive foothold in the future global food market. There's a lot of concern about being able to feed 50 billion people by the, the middle of the century. Is, is this part of the solution? Absolutely. I mean, it, whether you look at data from UNF, UNFAO or IPCC, um, Chatham House, the consensus amongst global leading authorities on food systems and food security is that we need to drastically change our protein supply um, and reduce our reliance on industrial animal agriculture as, as you know, the only means of producing uh, meat products. There was a report that came out a number of weeks ago called the Eat Lancet Commission. Uh, which was an effort from 37 of the world's leading scientists who have spent several years trying to reach scientific consensus on what the plate of 2050 will need to look like if we're to realistically feed the world within planetary boundaries without you know, crossing those irreversible ecological tipping points that I think we can all agree we need to um, keep within. And the plate that they presented, the conclusion they came to, uh, was that a, a, only a fraction of our plate we can afford to be animal-based protein by mid-century if we're to genuinely you know, feed everybody within planetary boundaries. And then they offered a comparison of the current Western plate where there's more than 600 times the red meat based on those recommendations that we're currently consuming and more than 200 times the poultry. 
And so I, I think that traditional proteins will be part of the mix by mid-century, but we're going to have to have uh, alternatives as well. Is it conceivable that in your lifetime you might see animal husbandry disappear? Uh, look, I'm not sure about that. I think that uh, there will be demand among some consumers for coming decades for uh, traditionally produced proteins. You know, there'll always be a place for, or at least for the coming decades, for Australia's Wagyu beef in, uh, you know, upper middle class Chinese markets, for example. Um, but yes, I think that we'll see a considerable shift and there's going to have to be a considerable shift uh, based on the resource resources we have available to us. Uh, there was a quote from Uma Valetti, the CEO of Memphis Meats, doing cell cultured meat in the US about, and I, I don't know what word for word, so I won't try and uh, quote him directly, but he basically spoke to the fact that he sees cell culturing technology as the next great domestication. Just like we you know, took animals from the wild and started farming them and selectively breeding them, he believes this will be the next step in our evolution as a species uh, towards sustainable food production. Thomas, where do you think your company, Food Frontier, is going to be in 10 years' time, say? Well, it's an interesting question because at the moment we, are, we exist to support uh, the growth of an ecosystem in Australia for, for this space. So you might complete um, so your job in that time We might right? complete our job. I'd be delighted <laughs> if we were able to uh, step back and say our, our work is done. Um, I think perhaps we might... Uh, eventually shift to becoming an industry association uh, for the industry that we support the startup of. Um, we'll see. I mean, part of what we do at the moment is, is sort of consultancy services in addition to the thought leadership and advocacy. And so whether it's a startup that's wanting to um, raise capital and, and launch a product into the market, or whether it's an existing food manufacturer, or even meat manufacturer, um, who's wanting to understand this space, how it's evolving and how they can engage, I think that will be an ongoing uh, service that we can offer people. Well, all the very best with it. Thank Thomas you very much. Thomas King from uh, Food Frontier, thanks for your time in the Evoke Egg Studio. It's been a pleasure.